Hello church family. Thank you all so much for tuning in today. Uh, we're going to continue our study on Psalm 46 uh, for this week's midweek Bible study. Um, so <clears throat> before we get started though, let's, uh, let's open up in prayer, shall we? Father, I come before you, thankful for your scriptures that they guide us. They're there for us, that we they can uh, comfort us. And that you love us so much that you would give them to us that we can read them and be comforted. Father, we come before you asking that you would use this time to, to grow us spiritually, that your spirit would be with us to give us eyes to see and ears to hear, that you would open up our hearts and our minds to, to see the truths in these scriptures so we may be closer to you and better to represent you to the world. And live for you in all the moments of our lives, even in hard times and in troubles when things aren't good. So, Father, we come before you asking that you bless this time for the glory of your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. So, um, let's start off by reading Psalm 46. God is our refuge and strength. A very present help in trouble. Therefore we will not fear. Though the earth gives way. Though the mountains are moved to the heart of the sea. Though its waters roar and foam. Though the mountains tremble at its swelling. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God. The holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God will help her when the morning dawns. The nations rage, the kingdoms totter. He utters his voice and the earth melts. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Come, behold the works of the Lord. How he has brought desolations on the earth. He makes war cease to the ends of the earth. He, he breaks the bow. He shatters the spear. He burns the chariot with fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Today we're really going to focus in on uh, verse 8. So let me read that one more time. Come, behold the works of the Lord, how he has brought desolations on the earth. That's a tough topic to teach about. It's super easy to talk about how God is our refuge and he's our strength and he's there for us in our times of trouble and he's very present with us and we're not alone and the Lord is, is there. He's guiding us. That's super easy to talk about and it, it, it brings me joy and, and I think it's easy for you as well to, to hear about or to think about that as God is our, as those good things, you know, as he's the one who loves us. And protects us. We can hide in him. We can seek our strength in him. That God is with us and we're not alone. But this is tough to think about. It's, it's tough to talk about. This idea. That the works of the Lord. Include. How he brings. Desolations. On the earth. How he brings. Destruction. How God brings wrath or, or judgment. But God brings the hard times and the trials. That's tough. That's hard. But we've got to be careful. Because, because of that difficulty, it's easy for us, the temptations there, to go, hey, that, that's, not, that's not my God. My God is the one who loves and cares and cherishes. My God is the one who protects and looks out. 
My God isn't the one who, who brings desolation and destruction. But the real God, the God that's revealed in, in these holy scriptures of the Bible, is a God who does love and care. And also one who's willing to discipline and willing to bring destruction and desolations on the earth. And if we're not careful, it's easy for us to make a God that we want and not to believe in the real God who has some characteristics that are tough and not easy to talk about. And so... On this topic, that the works of the Lord include desolations and destructions, I want to incorporate three Bible verses um, to help us kind of think through that idea and, and to swallow the idea that, you know, man, God, God is complete. He's not just a God of love, and He definitely isn't just a, a God of anger and destruction, but He's both. And just like us, because we are made in his image, he's both. I mean, just God refers to himself as the Heavenly Father. And a good father loves his children, loves his wife, loves his family, protects them, provides for them, teaches them, spends time with them, plays with them. But also a good father is very much willing to discipline his children because he loves them, because he wants to, to take care of them. He wants them to grow up to be good adults who are uh, going to be good husbands and wives for the future of their family, who are going to be good members of society, who are helpful and productive, who are good members of a community, who are there for one another. Because the father wants their kid not to grow up to be a brat, not to grow up and, and be selfish. Because of that, a father is willing to discipline his children, to correct them, so that they can be a better person. And many times that discipline doesn't feel good. And so as you think about God as the one who brings destruction and he is the one, the works of his hands include desolations and discipline. Try to put that in a parental framework. Because a good parent will discipline their kids, will correct them of their ways so they can be a better person. And God wants to do the same thing. So let's uh, let's tie in some other scripture to this to kind of give us a complete idea of this this uh, this topic. The God is the one who who does bring destruction sometimes, and that's okay. <clears throat> the first verse I want to mention uh, is simply Hebrews thirteen eight. Hebrews thirteen eight simply says. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. You know, many people will say, well, that's, that's the God of the Old Testament. The God of the Old Testament was the one who would bring destruction and, and, and he would uh, correct his people and do those type of things. But, but the God of the New Testament, well, maybe he grew up or something happened. He's different. He's, he's the only God of love. But passages like 13.8 tell us that the God hasn't changed. The God doesn't change. That Jesus Christ is the same yesterday in the Old Testament. He is the same today. And he will be the same in the future. And, and that brings us much comfort as, as Jesus promises different things. And as God holds himself to those promises, we take comfort in the fact that God doesn't change. And he stays true to what he says he will do. And that includes characteristics that are maybe uncomfortable for us too. We see a pattern in the Old Testament where God loves his people so much he's willing to correct them 
and to bring discipline to their life. And, and many times that discipline isn't pleasant. And that discipline may include destruction. That's hard and that's tough. But we see that pattern that God loves his people so much. And he tells us what he's doing behind the scenes and how he's orchestrating this discipline so the people will be corrected. And nowadays we, we don't get that view behind the curtain. We don't, we don't get that word from the Lord that he tells us, hey, man, you guys are doing this wrong, and so I'm going to work on this over here to, to discipline you and set you straight, to humble you, to bring you back to me. You know, we, we don't get that. So maybe we think that God doesn't do that anymore. But, but if the Lord doesn't change, then just because we're not being told what God's doing doesn't mean that he's not doing those same things. We see a very clear pattern of behavior throughout the Old Testament. And I don't want us to think that that changed all of a sudden in the New Testament, because it doesn't, because God doesn't change. And just because we don't have that view behind the curtain doesn't mean it's not happening. And the thing is, is the Lord in the Old Testament is still just as loving and forgiving and long-suffering and patient as he ever is. Man, the Lord would put up with generations and generations of people and trying everything to get them to change before he would bring destruction. God, that wasn't just his first tool in his toolbox. It's like he wanted to correct people. Man, that wasn't the first thing he ran to. Man, no, he would send prophet after prophet at them to to instruct them, to get them to change, to try to convince them to turn back to the Lord and his ways. And, and many times it wouldn't work. And so as a last resort, God would bring destruction and discipline and hardship upon the people to humble them and to break them and make them return to him, to make them realize that the little carvings and false statues that they have weren't answering their prayers. They don't save them. They don't rescue them. They need to return to the Lord and follow Him and, and to serve Him only. So, God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He doesn't change. And just because it in the Old Testament we see uh, that picture behind the curtain where God isn't telling us what's happening, doesn't mean He does not doing that now. God very much loves us and is willing to discipline us and to correct us like a good father, like a good parent who wants to correct his children. The next passage I want to tie into this topic of, of the works of the Lord bring do include destruction is Ezekiel 33. Specifically, Ezekiel 33 11 and 14 through 16. Ezekiel 33, 11. God says this, Say to them, As I live, declares the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked would turn from this way and live and turn back, turn back from their evil why will you die, O house of Israel? And verse 14. Again, though I say to the wicked, you will surely die. Yet if he turns from his sin and does what is just and right, if the wicked restores the pledge and gives back what was taken by robbery and walks in the statutes of life, not doing injustice, he shall surely live and he shall not die none of the sins that he has committed shall be remembered against him and he has done what is just and right he shall surely live yes the works of the Lord include bringing destruction sometimes but God takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked. He takes no pleasure in the suffering of people. Just like a good parent. 
just like a good father takes no pleasure in the disciplining of their children. I've talked to many parents and and they say it often hurts them so much more to have to discipline their child than any pain that they could cause on them. That the, the heartache and the pain and the tears that they see destroy that parent on the inside because they wish there was another way. They wish that they didn't have to discipline their kid. They wish the child would listen. They wish that child would not be that way. And the parent has tried everything under the sun to get them to learn. But the, the kid just won't have it. And so as a last-ditch effort, the parent disciplines the child physically. Just like God. God says, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but instead I wish that the wicked would turn from the way and live. He would turn back, turn back from the evil of his ways. Man, that's what God wants. The Lord takes no pleasure in bringing destruction. He takes no pleasure, no joy, no happiness. No, I told you so. None of that is in the Lord when he brings destruction. He takes no pleasure, no enjoyment in having to discipline people, in having to make them hurt, to bring them back to him. None. But because he loves us, because he cares about us, he's willing to correct us. He's willing to discipline us so we will learn. So we will be humbled and, and come back to him and turn from our ways. Yes, the Lord sometimes brings destruction. The works of God do include disciplines. Things are unpleasant to feel. And he takes no pleasure in it. He loves us. He cares about us. And many times there's a, that desire, that wish, man, is there another way that this could have happened? But many times we are too stubborn or too caught up in what we're doing. And we don't listen to the many warnings that we get. We don't listen to all the signs that are telling us to turn back. And so God is the last ditch effort, the final thing that he uses. He's willing to bring discipline into our lives to correct us. Yes, the works of God do include bringing destructions. Just as Psalm 46 says, Come behold the works of the Lord, how he has brought desolations on the earth. But God doesn't enjoy doing that. And God hasn't changed. And the final verse I want to bring in comes once again out of Hebrews. And it's Hebrews 12, 5 through 7. Hebrews 12, 5 through 7. Have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons? It says, My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord. Do not be weary when reproved by him. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves. He chastises every son whom he receives. It is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom the father does not discipline? In Hebrews 12, the people uh, who this chapter and, and this book are addressed have experienced some kind of discipline from the Lord. But the writer of Hebrew, Hebrews talks to them and tells them, Hey, I know it hurts, but don't be angry at 
that God's discipline of you. Don't be angry when he chastises you and corrects you. But consider that, his love, because he wants to make you more like his son. He, he disciplines those he loves. If he didn't love us, he'd let us go on our own way and, and live our own life doing the things that we want that would eventually lead to our destruction with no purpose of turning back. But because God loves us, he, he wants to prevent us from that outcome. And he's willing to correct us and bring us discipline. And maybe even bring destruction and hard times into our lives to correct us. And bring us back on the path. But he does it because he loves us. He does it because he cares. He doesn't enjoy watching people suffer. God's not evil. You know, as... Me and my wife, we, we watch uh, Criminal Minds lately. We've really been getting into that uh, that profiling and, and, and that type of stuff. But what separates an evil person is the fact that they enjoy watching people suffer. They, they enjoy watching people die. They enjoy watching life bleed out from them. They get some kind of sick joy from that. That is evil. That's evil. But the Lord doesn't enjoy the suffering. He doesn't enjoy watching that. He only does it because he has to. To correct us and to bring us back to the path of righteousness. To bring us closer to him so we will know, man, we've I drifted away. I'm not, I'm not walking close to God. Because of that, the Lord will bring us back closer to him. And if he has to, he'll do that with discipline. And that doesn't feel good, just like Hebrews 12 reminds us. That doesn't feel good to be reproved by God. It doesn't feel good to be corrected, to feel his chastisement. But, but he does it because he loves. And, and it's a super awkward thing to talk about. And yeah, the works of God do, in fact, include destruction it's tough it's tough to think about that because we talk so much about his love and his care which is all true but God also loves us so much that he's willing to discipline us to correct us because he loves us and to bring us back to the path of righteousness it's tough. It's not an easy idea to swallow, but it's true. It is in the scriptures. We can't make a God in our own image. We can't make a God that, that we want. No, no, no. We have to embrace the Lord for who he really is. And the Lord is the one who loves us and cares for us and sent his son to die for us. The Lord is the one who is our refuge and our strength in our times of need. The Lord is the one who rescues us and is present in our times of need. But he's also the one who's willing to correct us and maybe even bring destruction if he has to in order to set us on the right path that's walking with him once again. Like I said, it's, it's tough. But I didn't want to skip over it. I didn't want to glance by it. Because when it comes, when those passages come up in Scripture, it's easy to skip over them. But we need to talk about it and have a full view of who God is. And yes, the works of the Lord do include the destruction and desolations He has brought on the earth. We need to be okay with that. And hopefully, these verses help us swallow that truth a little better. Let's go to the Lord in prayer, shall we? Father, it is hard and difficult to think about this. But we see it in the scriptures. We can't run away from it. We can't turn a blind eye from it. It is who you are. God, there is a part of you 
that is dangerous. There's a part of you that doesn't put up with evil, that doesn't put up with wickedness. There's a part of you that is willing to discipline us and to correct us and to bring us closer to you. Father, thank you for loving us so much that you're not willing to let us wander off, but you always want us close to you. And you'll use any means necessary to bring us close to you, to put us back on the path of righteousness and living for you. Thank you, God, for loving us so much that you would discipline us. And Father, I pray that as we talk about this, may we be mature and not hate you for that discipline that you bring. May we humbly accept our chastisement if it ever comes our way and recognize that you've done it for a purpose and you've done it out of love and you don't enjoy doing it. That we would learn and come closer to you. Father, thank you for this time. Thank you for your scriptures. I pray that you would help us understand them. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Church, thank you all so much for tuning in. It's been a tough topic, but sometimes you got to talk about tough stuff. Thank you all so much. God bless.